and welcome back to Franklin Covey's weekly podcast on Leadership with Scott Miller. That's me. I'm your host and interviewer each week. You may also know me as the author of the Master Mentor series, number one and number two, out and available in print, audio, digital, and video, where each year for HarperCollins, I write a different book about 30 of my favorite guests on the podcast and a particular transformational insight that they shared. And we'd love to have you pick up a copy of Master Mentors, Volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3, coming out in 2024. Now, one of the cool parts of this podcast, as you may know, in addition to being the largest weekly leadership podcast, it's also audio and video. Obviously, a much larger portion of our audience consumes it being via audio. But the reason I mention that is because perhaps some of you today are watching us on audio or video, and you may notice a very large red lesion on my temple. That's because about five hours ago, I was at a dermatologist, and they actually took off a little bit of skin cancer. And I'm sharing that because I have had this like sort of pimple on my, my temple, no rhyme intended, for about two or three months now. And I went to my wife a couple of days ago and said, you know, I have this pimple that's actually not clearing up. I wonder if there's a reason to see a dermatologist. She, she said, you think? So she made me an appointment at a dermatologist. I went in this morning and the dermatologist said, yeah, I'm quite certain that's skin cancer. Let's do a biopsy. I think you've caught it in plenty of time. Not a worry, but you should know that the average age of diagnosis for skin cancer in white men is age 55. I'm 55 in about five weeks. She said a couple of things, wear sunscreen, sell your convertible, and I'll see you in three days. And so that's just my PSA in case some of you are noticing this red lesion on our, my forehead, which is why we've invited today the world-renowned dermatologist, Dr. Glenn Stur. I'm kidding. He's not a dermatologist. That's my PSA. Today we do have, however, the renowned entrepreneur, philanthropist, and now author, Glenn Stearns. You know him from a variety of roles in life, including being the star of Discovery Program's Undercover Billionaire. His book is launching today. We have him and the privilege of being a guest on Leadership. Glenn Stearns, welcome to our podcast. How you doing? So you dropped out How of dermatology doing? school, decided to make a billion dollars in real estate. Good choice, my friend. I did, but I happen to know a thing or two about cancer, and you don't mess with it, right? It's, it's definitely something you want to take serious. I've been and there. In fact, Glenn, you and I become friends over the last few months as I became a fan of your book and have been following you on social. Uh, one of your stories is the fact that you have been a survivor of cancer and have talked very vulnerably, openly about its impact on your family, your health, your outlook on life. Most recently, throat cancer, not actually quite, quite recently ago. Let, let's, let's start there. Will you talk about your cancer experience and how has it changed you as a father, a husband, a, a, a philanthropist, as an author, as a business leader? How are you different? Well, you know, I, it's interesting how cancer, look, people that suffer and die from cancer, it's horrible. But if you're lucky enough to have been told you have something that could kill you and you survive it, hopefully it opens up your mind to gratitude and just being very thankful for everything and accepting love and a lot of different things that, you know, maybe we take for granted. So I was very grateful. It scared the heck out of me. And yeah, I lost 45 pounds and went through a lot of, a lot of, um, painful, uh, you know, weeks and months, but the reality is, and I'm grateful that I got to have a, um, you know, a different perspective on life from cancer. Glenn, it's, it's in your book. You write a lot about it. Uh, people know you from all different, perhaps, walks of life, right? You have been an enormously successful leader in the real estate industry. You have owned and launched some of the largest mortgage companies in the nation. You have reinvented yourself multiple times over, including now with Kind Lending. You are an author now of this now number one Amazon new release called Integrity, My Slow and Painful Journey to Success. Many people know you as the star of Discovery Program's Undercover Billionaire. Would you rewind a little bit and talk about how you got into the mortgage business, how you built that into a multi-billion dollar empire, changing countless lives along the way, including the American dream and 
people that have worked with and for you that have transformed their lives educationally, financially. Rewind, you weren't always on the path to become a billionaire. No, I, um, you know, I was, um, I grew up in Maryland and uh, to some, you know, middle class family struggling with alcohol. You know, I was dyslexic, failed fourth grade. I had a child in the eighth grade. And um, so a lot of adversity in my life that um, helped me later. I went to college first to my family and then decided to go to California. Um, I ended up starting a mortgage company 10 months after being in the, the, the trenches, so to speak. And, and so a lot of my lessons were all based on, oh, what do I do now? You know, and, and um, so when I got into a mortgage business, you know, it was um, just about really solving problems. And as I grew through the 90s, I was able to take advantage in the, uh, at the downturn in 2007 and 8 when everyone was crumbling. Uh, we kind of, you know, I'd had a little thicker skin at that point and was able to take it to number one mortgage company in the country, number one wholesale, number two overall company. And um, so, yeah, I was able to uh, take advantage of some other people that were distracted, I guess you could say, and, and built a, a company we're real proud of, um, sold that to Blackstone, and then went on and um, took some time off after the cancer and um, have redone it again with Kind Lending. Glenn, I think I misunderstood you. You meant to say you were a child in eighth grade, not you had a child in eighth grade. Yes and yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I know this I to be one. true because you've written about it. You, your book really is a, it's kind of like a gift of love that, that validates people from all walks of life. I mean, you were like, you, you mentioned a middle-class child from Maryland in a family of alcoholics that had you know, no plan, no vision for your life, you became a father in eighth grade. And to this day, I believe you are connected with um, the mother of your first daughter, right? And, and, yeah, my mother and daughter. That's right. And you've gone on to have this remarkable success in life. How did becoming a father in eighth grade, like I have a son who's in seventh grade. I, I, it's incomprehensible that a year from now, I, I can't even, put words to that, how did that change you over time, becoming a father in eighth grade? Well, again, <clears throat> you know, um, when you, when we're confronted with something that seems like it's, and it's, you know, I am done. How am I ever going to recover from this? When you get those kind of, you process that in your head, and then all of a sudden it turns out to be one of the greatest things that ever happened in your life. Mm. You, I, I had that happen a few times early on to where I began to be able to see or look for the silver linings in life. And, and so I, I, you know, I take a lot of my success and I take it and I look back and I say it happened because of having a child so young and failing fourth grade and having different issues because it ended up setting me up to realize there's something good that's gonna come out of this. I just have to open my eyes and look for it. I think it's a great reminder to people that are watching and listening from around the world in you know, nearly 200 company, countries. Everybody's facing something that may seem insurmountable. It may seem devastating. It may seem unrecoverable. I think as I've come to know you in the last few months, Glenn, you seem to have a lot of talents that are replicable if other people were to learn them. One of them, clearly you are a resilient individual, but you also seem to possess this skill of thinking long-term in a short-term world. You seem to have this discipline not to be overwhelmed by immediate setbacks or bad news or disappointments. How have you developed this skill of res not just resiliency, but being able to think, being able to think, you know, this too shall pass, and there's light at the end of this tunnel. I just can't see it. Transfer to the millions of people watching and listening that are dealing with something that seems overwhelming right now. What should they do and think and say to get them through what might seem like a um, insurmountable challenge in their life? Right. So I was very lucky to have. Um a mentor. I've had many mentors in my life. Uh, when I got older, 
when I was younger, I didn't really have them. And then when I found the power of mentorship, I went and sought them out. But one gentleman, he said exactly what you said, this too shall pass. And when I was in the middle of a situation, and I call it a situation because, you know, cancer, mm, that's more of a problem, right? I mean, you could die. Um, but when you have a business situation, it's really about surrounding yourself with good people and being able to have people to bounce ideas off of and then figuring it out. It's just problem solving and communicating. And so what I've been now, as it's gone on and repeated over and over again, I've realized, okay, let's get more people that have good minds, put them in the same room and let's try to figure this out. And if there are issues coming up, let's communicate it ahead of time so that people aren't, you know, that they're prepared and they're not shocked of what's going on. And when you do that, usually you set yourself up for people to understand. And if you allow yourself um, to live in a world of integrity, speaking of the book, um, people will be there for you. It doesn't mean they're going to bail you out and write you a big check, but it means that they're going to be there to give you their shoulder or maybe even introduce you to somebody or do whatever you need to do. So it's more about living, um, you know, a, a good life and knowing that you're going to run into bumps no matter what. And then when you're in it, go, okay, I'm here. Now what? Glenn, perhaps to your annoyance, you're often referred to as billionaire Glenn Stearns. You're obviously much more than that. But you have you are you are the now co-founder of your second mortgage company, Kind Lending, that is growing exponentially. You are a husband. You are a father. You are a philanthropist. Up until recently, and maybe even in the future, who knows? You were a, a star of reality program on television. How did you possibly find the time to author a four hundred page book sharing kind of all the lessons? of your journey, journey, mainly the slow and painful lessons. Why did you write a book? You know, I, um, I didn't realize I was gonna do a television show either before a book. And it happened sort of by accident. I had done one 18 years ago with my wife. That was by accident. And um, someone had suggested us. And so as people kept calling going, hey, do you wanna do another show? I would always tell them, no, I'm, you know, I'm a business guy, but if you really want to follow me around and you give me, you know, 90 days with no money and no contacts and watch me build another business, I'd do that show. And I'd say that over and over again. And discovery took me up on it. I did it, but I did it for my kids because I wanted them to see dad, you know, work hard and fight hard. And when I did that, I had no idea that, it would lead to so many people that said, wow, you really helped me. And, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for, you know, watching your lessons and things like that. And so that touched me. I really, I'm proud of that. And so at that point I thought, well, maybe, you know, a lot of people would always say, Glenn, write a book, you know, you really should with everything that's happened in your life. And I thought, okay, well, if it could help a few people, I'd love to do it. So I took up the task and, um, took, about three years to get it all done. But, uh, you know, it's here. I'm really, really proud of the book. Um, proud of, you know, the fact that my, I won't call it style, but, but it, the way I kind of go about life is I usually lead with my flaws. Um, and what that means to me is just be vulnerable and allow people to see that and then you get closer to people and you surround yourself with good people. Um, I think a lot of people go out there and they lead uh, with being perfect. Yeah. And yeah. we all know no one's perfect. So, Glenn, beautifully said, I, I speak often on this podcast and write in my own books that vulnerability is a leadership competency. It's a, it's a marriage competency. It's a parenting competency. We see a lot of leaders that have been led wrongly to believe that they're supposed to be a model of everything and they can't make any mistakes and they can't show any cracks and everything has to be perfect. And they think that's what they should be showing their team. And in fact, their team wants to know that they also have struggles and they have sometimes self-esteem issues and that they're not omniscient or the genius in the room. 
The book really is a masterful collection of a lot of your life lessons and business lessons, setbacks and successes as well. There's no question you've had, you know, remarkable success economically and, and, and professionally. Would you take a few minutes and talk to everybody right now in life that's looking for more? Perhaps they're thinking about a stretch in their career, right? They, they, they want to become a vice president, but they don't know how to do that in a company. Or maybe they have a dream of a side hustle and they want it to not be earning, you know, $40 a week, but $4,000 a week. I'd like you to sort of, you know how you say sometimes people are, are in a life or death experience and their life flashes before their eyes? Would you maybe do a similar flash before your eyes if you think about maybe the three or four or five biggest lessons you've learned in life that everybody could apply, whether they're from wealth or education or they have the same economic um, headwinds or tailwinds, would you maybe just give us a master class in success? Whether someone's looking to open an Etsy store with their crocheted Kleenex boxes or they want to become a realtor or a restaurateur, whatever it is, I'd like you to kind of just um, dive deep into your, you know, 40 plus years in business. Give us a master class on success. So I would, um, I'd start with never measure yourself with someone else's ruler, right? We go at it in life or in business and we start to compare ourselves. And I think that when we do that, we try to be someone else, we lose our authenticity and people want to work with people, right? They don't want to work with someone who's trying to be someone else. So if you become authentic and real and personable, you will attract people. That's one thing, right? And then I would, I, I've always also looked at people that again are trying to be somebody else when you don't need to be. And what I mean by that is, what is your gift? Your gift is different than someone else's. Some people can retain, you know, they can read a book and they've got it all down in a second. And other people, you read a book, you go, I don't even know what I just read. I didn't retain nothing. But they're good with math or they're good people skills. So what is your gift? And focus on that. Don't try to be the other guy because you'll never, you never be able to, to do that or you'll do it poorly. But when you, what you're good at, you can thrive in. And then you just got to outwork people. You got to out hustle people. You got to stay later than people get earlier. People live by an example of what you want. And I tell you, there's so many people out there that don't understand the importance of setting the example of what you expect for the other person. And so in terms of leadership, I love seeing um, people that aren't afraid to get dirty and help their team by showing them that there's nothing beneath you. And when you put all that together, you usually, and of course, again, integrity, when you lead with integrity, you'll have people that are gonna care about you and that are gonna follow you and hopefully if you put the right people in place, meaning strengths all around you in different areas of what you need, you'll you'll probably uh, have a better, well, you will succeed or you're gonna have a better shot at succeeding. Glenn, you and I have a lot in common. Other than, you know, four commas, we share that we're passionate about work ethic. When I'm talking on podcast as a guest, and people ask me, what's the commonality amongst the 300 guests you've had on your program? Best-selling authors, business titans, movie stars, researchers. I say, you know, honestly, it's hard work. These people aren't any smarter than the rest of us. Most of them just outworked the other person. They were willing to do what the other person wasn't willing to do. And, right. and, and in many ways, that's not popular. Now you hear, work smarter, not harder, 10-hour work week, less work. And I don't want anybody to, whose li life to be defined by just working. But what I hear from you is that you think hard work is still in vogue. But maybe, maybe it's not in vogue, but you still think it's a crucial formula to success. It's, I mean, absolutely. 
right? You have to be able to sacrifice more. There's, there is no free ride in life, you know? And, uh, what was Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours or whatever, just to get good at something. If you want to get great, you got to be working harder and longer and, and smarter than the, your competition. You have to, there is nobody, I don't think out there. That's just got it. You know, what was the saying, you know, the, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Yes. So, yes. you know, pretty easy. Yeah. Well said. I think it's chapter 12 in your book. You write about the concept of breaking away from the herd. Can you share a little bit about that? And why is that important for people to break away from the herd? Well, you end up, you know, there's a lot of comfort in, in being at the same place with everyone else. And, and that this is a little off topic, but it's in there. There's the, I call some people the, the basement people and the balcony people, right? There's a lot of people that want you down where they are. And if you're in a business and you're all about equal, you know, and an equal, um, you know, um, maybe distribution or profit or sales or whatever, and then you all feel comfortable. But when you start to break away from the herd, you get people taking shots at you and you get, you know, you stick your neck up and, and out. And, and sometimes it's not pleasant when people, they end up looking at all your salespeople. Wow, they got good sales. They start trying to steal them. There's a lot of things that happen when you break away that that isn't good. But eventually, when you keep doing it, you're getting farther away, you get you gain the respect of your competitors. You gain the respect of of people that are, you know, your customers. And you get to a place where you realize it's good to not try to emulate the other people, but to be yourself. And when, when we took Kind Lending and we ran this new mortgage company, I said, I don't want to be like everybody else. I don't want to be just in a tie and I want to be completely, you know, a, a robot in lending. I want to focus on our people and our people, they're going to work 10, 12 hour days here. I want them to be happy. And if they're happy, it's going to show and the customer is going to be able to see that. So we started doing little things like we created a portal. Everybody puts their, all of our brokers put their business through this portal. We called it the quickie, right? So it's the quickie portal. We've got happy beginnings and happy endings. When your loan closes, we're easy. And we started doing these things. People go, did they just say that? Did they say a happy ending? Did they, you know, things that you go, oh my gosh, they're a lender. They're not supposed to say that. And our people laugh. They have fun. Yeah, it's a little edgy, but guess what? You're spending all this time. Let's have some, let's have a laugh. Let's enjoy ourselves because then you got a heart. Then the, then the company has a soul and people want to help other people. And then you end up breaking away from the herd. We were up 601% market share from this time last year. We doubled our business from two months ago. Everyone else in lending space is having a really hard time. We've attracted all of these salespeople again. Why? because they know we're having fun over here. We're doing it differently, and we broke away from the herd, so. I mean, you could argue you're sort of the Southwest Airlines 30 years ago of the new mortgage. You're defying conventional wisdom that you can show honesty and integrity, you can make people's dreams come true, you can build a phenomenal culture, people come and stay, have fun doing it, and make some money along the way. It's kind of like common sense, Glenn. It's common sense, but people are afraid to break away from the herd, right? And I've used that selfless analogy. It's funny you'd say that because, you know, you're sitting there and you've got to say, you know, would, you know, put your seatbelt on and, you know, listen to your flight attendant. But they're like, they make fun of it, right? Hey, if the other person's crying, you know, tell them to be quiet and put your mask on, whatever, right? And it's funny. And it, why, do, why can't it be funny, right? I mean, you got to sit through the boring speech anyway, so you might as well make them laugh. And that's the same thing with the mortgage business. But you know why? Because people are afraid to take chances. And, you know, hey, I didn't get back in this business just because I want to go out and make a bunch of money. I love the business. I love the problem solving. I love the people aspect. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to have some fun. And we've said it. If you find it offensive or you don't like it here, it's okay. You don't have to work here or you don't have to bring your business here. And the more we say that, 
the more people go, I really appreciate your honesty. And then they come and they stay. And by the way, our receptionist right here, who's now our um, kindness um, liaison ambassador, she um, has been here 25 years because she was with us in the old company, came back. We've had people that are my assistant, 27 years, lots and lots of people that have been here 18 years or so since uh, the 2000 and um, seven and eight time frame. So lots of people, they come, they stay because they know we're a little different than everybody else. Glenn, another chapter in your book is called There'll Always Be a Bigger Boat. You've lived a fairly public lifestyle, right? I mean, you talk about the benefits of success in terms of the homes you and your wife have been able to acquire and the generosity that you've been able to share with others as philanthropists. You talk a lot about the home you have in Fiji and how that came about. Talk a little bit about why Fiji is such a passion of yours and related to this chapter about there'll always be a bigger boat. Well, you know, Fiji was a dream, right? It's like this wonderful getaway place. And, and um, you know, our place was pretty special. I mean, it was cover of Architectural Digest. Bill Gates had spent his honeymoon there. I mean, it wasn't an average place, and we were real proud of it. But I would go there in my mind whenever I'd be kind of having a tough time if I couldn't sleep, and I'd think of Fiji, and I would kind of be able to, you know, relax or whatever. But, um, you know, what happened was um, there's been – it was more about not taking yourself that serious and not thinking your material objects should be something that make you think you're better than anyone else because they're not, right? Having things, um, sometimes we get them because we say, man, we worked hard. And we deserve it. And so we go and we reward ourselves. Okay. But people don't usually get to see all the hard work. So what they might see is you bragging and boasting by all these things. And um, I remember I went and I, you know, I bought my um, my yacht and it was very nice. It had a helicopter. It was a really nice boat. And I was coming around the corners the first time we were getting on it in, um, in uh, somewhere in France and maybe Monaco. And we're coming around on our little tender and there it is, this most beautiful boat. And I'm like, Look at this, everybody. And my captain, he goes, that's not it. That's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's the next boat. Well, the, our boat was tucked in between these giant boats. Now, again, we've, we've got a helicopter on there, but these boats have like two helicopters on there, right? It's like, and they're going, couldn't you have parked it down at the other end and made me at least feel like for a second, you know? So you're saying my, my boat was blocking your boat. I apologize. My, my captain has no class. I, I apologize. Yeah, exactly. And, but that's and, the point. Don't take yourself that serious. And one more point on that. My, I have a buddy, John Elway, the, the, the uh, quarterback, ex quarterback of the Broncos. He was playing golf with the vice president of the United States, Dan Quayle. And they're out there and Dan is kind of hitting his club and he's, he's um, mumbling under his breath. And John says, what's wrong, Dan? And he says, you know, these two guys are beating us. And everybody wants to say they beat the vice president at golf. And John says, he leans over, puts his arm around the vice president. And he says, Dan, let's face it. We're both has-beens, you know? And, and I love that because you just can't take yourself that serious. You know, it just, it isn't worth it. Life isn't, isn't worth it, so. Glenn, part of your fame, if you will, uh, desired or not, is from your recent experience on this program called Undercover Billionaire, where you were the star and had an interesting concept. I actually had not read it prior to being, or, or seen it prior to being introduced to you. Would you take a few minutes and talk about the program, why you did it, what you hope would come of that, and what some of the lessons were that you took away from Undercover Billionaire? Sure. So, excuse me, about... 18 years ago, we were asked if we would do a show, and we did it called The Real Gilligan's Island. And um, someone had asked, suggested us. We did the show, and I won. And um, so for the next 15 years, people kept calling me 
from television, hey, do you want to do another show? And I'd always say, no, I'm a business guy. And then I said, at the, when, I, when I ended up getting the cancer, which has been now, again, nine years ago when it first came, um, I said, you know what? i tell you what I would do. I said, you can put me anywhere in this country with no money and no contacts. And let me build a business again. You want to watch that? I said, I'll do that. And the reason was... I had been through this whole cancer and my kids, my young kids never got to see dad fight hard, build, you know, have a team around me and um, do those kind of things. And I, and I thought if I could show them a little bit of what it means to work hard and, you know, have integrity and, and uh, surround yourself with good people, that'd be great. <clears throat> so that was, that's why I'd always say that. And then I get the call back. If you're serious, we'll do it. Well, I never really thought much more about it. Like I didn't put a plan together about what am I gonna do? So when they picked me up and said, you've got 90 days to go build a business with $100 and a beat up pickup truck and no contacts, I said, okay. And I got out of my plane, got into the, the truck, the beat up truck, and I'm looking at 20 cameramen and people all around. I go, what do I do now? And they go, go build a business. And I'm like, oh crap. Like, what am I going to do now? And um, so I really loved being put in a corner, being afraid, feeling I was going to fail. And, um, you know, in the show, what they didn't, what they cut out uh, two people. One of them was um, Richard Branson. And another was John Elway. They had him in the earlier part, but they just, I guess they didn't feel they needed that. And they asked him, would you guys like to go back in time and redo it all over again? And both those guys said, heck no. You know, what upside does Glenn have? He's going to probably fail 90 days to make a million dollar business. And um, I would never want to redo it again. I'm too old. And I thought, man, I thought those guys are both big entrepreneur guys. I thought they'd want to do it. And what am I missing? And so when I was in the middle of it, I, all of a sudden I realized I'm going to fail. This is not working out. And I wanted my kids to see me do something good. And now all they're going to see is their dad fail. And the, by the way, the whole world's going to see that. So I thought if I quit right now, they'll never make this show because they'll never have an ending. Well, in real life, that's how life is. You've got this thing on your one shoulder saying, quit, give up in anything, right? It's too hard. This is not working. And that's what we do is we either have to buckle down and we have to grit our teeth and we have to fight through that pain or our fears. And we end up, in this case, I did it with the business. I didn't give up. And I'm very proud of it. And, um, and I'm very proud of the results. And then it's a microcosm really of what, life is about. And, you know, when I look at it, I go, wow, this is exactly life. And the one last part I'll tell you is that I didn't expect was the thousands of people around the world that said, man, you changed my life. You gave me inspiration. And that made me feel really, really good. I didn't even expect that at all. I didn't do it for that. I wasn't thinking about that. And that's really why I wrote the book, right? Because I thought, hey, if I could help somebody that maybe is thinking, I want to give up. I'm going to quit. Um, don't. Glenn, I appreciate your time today. Your new book called Integrity is already a number one new release on Amazon in multiple categories. If you think your television program impacted lives, wait till you see the impact of people reading the book. My Slow and Painful Journey to Success by Glenn Stearns. Thank you, time. Thank you, sir, for your time. You're a class act. I've enjoyed talking with you. Tell us, before you leave, what's next for you? You've talked about kind lending. You're on a book tour, lots of keynotes, lots of interviews. What's next for you? Well, you know, I'm, I'm uh, doing a lot of mentoring right now, and I really enjoy that. That's something that I find therapeutic, I guess you could say, right? I, I really enjoy helping others try to succeed and, and be able to take their goals and and exceed them, like I said. And so uh, that's a big thing for me right now. I love mentoring, giving back. Um, that's, that's where I'm focusing a lot of my time. But I really appreciate this. Thank you so much, Scott, for having me. This has been real fun. The pleasure is ours. Thank you again, Glenn.
All right, take care. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. <laughs>